All right, I think there's only one way to start this message off because uh, no matter what words I say after this, it pales in comparison to what I'm about to read. This is what you need to hear today, okay? It comes from the Gospel of Luke, uh, the chapter 24. It says, on the very first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared. They went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over into the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and he ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Can you blame them? <laughs> right? I don't know what I would be doing if I had seen that with my very eyes. Think about it. Peter, the same Peter who we saw on Good Friday betray his rabbi, his teacher, his Lord, and his Savior. Look Jesus in the face and deny him. You think this is good news for Peter when he hears it? I do. He goes running to the tomb. He's thinking, could this actually be true? Could this be it? Is this the start of something new? You think, or you see, I think you and I, just like Peter, we're yearning for, but even more than that, we're obsessed with the new. Even if it's just new information, you know, we're constantly scrolling our phones and we're updating our feeds, aren't we? Maybe for you, it's a new opportunity. Maybe you never felt quite settled in the job that you have or that the work that you're doing. Maybe it's fitness, right? You work out like crazy, you post it online, you're trying to feel good, feel new, stay young. We live in a world that's obsessed with progress, trying to constantly evolve into a newer, better, stronger society. We are obsessed with the new. You wanna know what it is for me personally? It's technology. I love new technology. I'm fascinated by it. For example, have any of you seen uh, what AI can do nowadays? Artificial intelligence, right? Artificial intelligence, I'm sure you've seen it in the news, online, on social media. It can write an essay for you. Not an Easter message, trust me. <laughs> but it can write an essay for you. Did you know it can pass the bar exam? It can create original, never-before-seen art with just a single prompt that you type in. It's amazing. Like, for example, if you've ever wondered what it would look like if Mark Twain was in a biker gang, <laughs> that was it. AI can tell you. If you've ever wondered what it would look like if Betty White was a pirate or Michael Jackson was a, a cowboy, AI can tell you. Or maybe you wondered where this picture came from last year with the Pope wearing this puffy jacket. Well, that was AI, right? That didn't really exist. The Pope doesn't have that much swag. Maybe you stayed up late at night wondering what it would look like if Van Gogh painted a picture of Mr. T. <laughs> now, thanks to AI, we can know. Maybe you've always wondered what Abraham Lincoln looked like as a toddler if Abraham Lincoln had a beard still. Isn't that frightening? <laughs> Here's my favorite. Somebody had asked artificial intelligence to make a picture of Jesus taking a selfie at the Last Supper with his disciples. <laughs> it looks pretty realistic, doesn't it? It's crazy to see that. We're obsessed with the new. We are. Whether it's new technology, new innovations in medicine, new leaders who can help us break free from all of our problems. We love the new. Where are you obsessed with the new in your life? Now, here's the reason why we are obsessed with the new. You ready? 
it's because we can feel the old. And when I say the old, what I mean is all the stuff that is broken and bad and evil in this world. We can feel it weighing us down on a daily basis, filling us up with anxiety. So just talking about myself for a moment here, I don't like the fact now that every moment that my body doesn't operate how it used to, I would say in my prime, if you would, I don't like that. I'm only 36, right? I know that doesn't sound that old. It's still young, yes. But I get sore now from the weirdest things, okay? From coaching my little son's coach pitch team in baseball, getting up and down. I'll be sore the next day. Last year, I hate to admit this, I actually bent down too fast and I pulled something in my back, tying my shoe. I hate that that's the world that I live in. <laughs> Does anyone else feel those aches and pains? Yeah. Yeah. Some of you are like, more than you know. On a more serious note, I hate that we see headlines in the news that we continue to see. Shootings, evil, war, famine, homelessness. We see it over and over again. Seems like every time we turn on the news, there's something else. I hate that the same old problems of power and greed and arrogance and pride continue to corrupt our politics and the people that we need to have lead us on both sides of the aisle. I hate the fact that part of my job as a pastor is I have to bury my friends, my parishioners. I hate that I have to walk through couples talking about divorce that I've helped counsel in marriage. When I say that I hate that, it's not that I, I don't want to be there for them. I do. I, my heart loves to be there with a family who's grieving to remind them of this day, of what Jesus has accomplished. But when I say that I hate it, I feel that heaviness. I feel that broken. I see all that is broken in this world, and it weighs me down. I hate that I can feel the old, the bad, and the broken weighing me down. But I know each one of you can feel it as well. Look, we're obsessed with the new. But where are you feeling the old today? Where are you feeling it? Just know that that's why we hunger for new things. That's why we hunger for a better and brighter future, a better day to come. And that's what makes Easter everything. That's what makes this day everything because what we believe about Easter is that Jesus has delivered a death blow to all the old things. That's why billions of people around the world are gathering like this this morning. It's not just some sentimental celebration that spring is here. I know we like the blue bonnets, right? But it is way more than that. We are gathered like this because we believe that there is one king named Jesus Christ who confronted the old, he defeated it, and he rose and lived to tell about it. Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> That's what we've been celebrating at church all week. You know, last Sunday, Palm Sunday, as we talked about Jesus, he rode into Jerusalem, people saying, save us, calling him king. What Jesus was, was doing there was taking humanity's desire for a new day to dawn. Their expe expectation for something better to emerge. He was willingly placing it on his own shoulders as he rode into the holy city. And then just a few days later in what's known as Holy Thursday or Maundy Thursday, that mandate to love, as Christ tells us, love as I have loved you. We see Jesus serving his disciples, washing their feet, offering them, us, them and us this meal that he calls the Lord's Supper, where we get to receive the very presence of Christ, right? We get his body and his blood in, with, and under the bread and the wine. And then on Good Friday, Jesus allows all the old, all the bad, all the broken, all the evil, all the injustice, the punishment for sin that, that needs to be made, all that's awful in this world, he allows it to be placed on his shoulders, to be laid upon him, to be whipped upon him, almost to the point of him dying, and then him actually dying on the cross. And for a second there, doesn't it seem like the old is going to prevail again? And you know what the old thing is. Someone with a great message and a promise, they step forward, but it never lasts. They get cut down by all the old evils of this world. But now it's Sunday, 
S-O-N-D-A-Y, right? It's the best day of the week because of this reason that Jesus is alive. And that's what brings us together to celebrate. And maybe this has never hit you before, but we live in a world where people make lots of promises, don't they? Politicians make promises all the time, but most of them are corrupted or convicted. We live in a world where religious gurus make promises all the time. The biggest of them have uh, made promises, right? Like Confucius and Mohammed and Buddha. But guess what? All of them are dead and still in the grave. We live in a day where influencers are making all kinds of promises online. But you and I know that they're only in it for the subscriptions and the brand deals. But then here comes Jesus, right? Here comes Jesus and he makes a promise and he fulfills it. And in his rising from the grave, what he has done is he has confronted all the evils that stir in and around us. In his rising from the dead, he has confronted and he has defeated death, which haunts and it taunts each and every one of us. He promised that he would do it. And he did. Now, you might be a little cynical. And you might be here saying, like, good for him, right? Like one guy defeated death. That's great for him. But what about me? What's that mean for me? Got a little story for you. When I was in elementary school, I knew a, a kid's family who won the lottery. Million bucks. It wasn't like the mega millions, but they won a million bucks. And I was so excited to know him because I was like, I know a millionaire, <laughs> right? That's, that's pretty cool when you're that little. And so I remember going to my dad one day and I was like, hey, I know a millionaire. One of my family or one of the families at school, they won the, the lottery. And my dad just very lovingly looked at me and said, good for them. I still got to go to work in the morning, <laughs> Right. There may be part of you who is sitting here, hearing the story of one man who lived, died, and rose again and saying, good. But what's it mean for me? It's like my friend who family won the lottery. Good for them. But what's that mean for me? I still got to go to work in the morning. See, this is what makes Easter the history-shaking, earth-rattling, reality-changing truth that it's because of Jesus, not only that he confronts these things, but he defeats all of these things. But what he does is this great exchange, right? He earns this victory for us, one that we can never, ever achieve on our own. And what he does is he gives that to you, and in place, he takes all the bad and all the broken and all the old and all the sin that we, we have in our life. He gives you perfection, and on the cross, you see what our sin was owed. Easter is the story of Jesus confronting the old and then handing the victory in a new reality to each and every one of us. He hands it to you, and he hands it to me. He makes a promise that he would do this, and then he does it. God has always been faithful to his word throughout scripture. He gives it to you. He gives it to me. And that's what Paul is kind of getting at in Colossians. If we could just go there for a moment, you have it on the screens for you. Uh, Colossians chapter three, he says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, okay, Stephen, I got it, right? We're supposed to be made brand new through the work of Jesus Christ, but I don't feel very new. And newsflash, my husband and wife, they ain't all that new either, right? I get it. But listen to what Paul says. Paul says that the message of Christianity is this, that those who come to the resurrected Christ with faith in their hearts, and remember, faith is nothing more than acknowledging your need for Jesus, putting your trust in him. And what I love about Jesus is he tells us that it's not that we have to have this mountain-sized faith in life. Yes, he wants to grow us to get us there, but what does he say? The faith is small as a mustard seed. It can move mountains. Think about that. Those who come to Jesus with need, they are connected to his death and he forgives you and he pays your penalty of sin. His resurrection means that someday you too will rise. It means a brand new life for me and for you through faith. You are connected to him. You get everything that he won. But then the Christian life is about setting your hearts and your minds on higher things where Christ is because the truth is you're not gonna be fully brand new, completely brand new, revealed as totally new 
until Christ comes back. We have these two natures at war right now. You have been made completely brand new in Christ, yet we still see the old. We still feel the broken. We still struggle with sin in our life. Paul says that the brand new you, the totally new you, is hidden with Christ, and that the life of a follower of Jesus is learning what that means today. You know, little by little, God, he, he calls us to do that, to continue learning, doesn't he? To learn what it's going to be like when that sin nature is just stripped away from us in the very end. It's learning each and every day that you are a brand new person in Christ. And then you're trying to push the implications of that into every practical corner of your life so that you can get a taste and that you can give the world a taste of what it means to be this new creation. Now, knowing that God will bring the work to completion in the end, but nonetheless, what I get to say to you is that if you are here and you have a heart full of need and you bring it to Jesus, though the work won't be completed until the end when he returns, you are still brand new right now. This week, I was trying to figure out just some analogy to kind of hammer home what Paul is talking about. For us, and this is what I came up with. Okay, it's like my son Beckett when he signed up for um, baseball. It was in kindergarten. He didn't sign up. We signed him up, right? But <laughs> it was adorable. It really was. We signed him up, and then we go to the store. We buy him all the stuff, right? And I loved it way more than he did at that point. We made sure that this little kid not only had the jersey, but he had the hat, he had the pants, he had the cleats, he had the belt. He didn't need a belt, but we got him a belt. He had the batting helmet, he had the batting gloves, he had the glove for the field. This kid looked good. That's the way I wanted it. And then what happened is he and the rest of his teammates, they played their first game. Then it, all, it hit me all of a sudden, all the parents there, that these kids have no idea what they're doing, <laughs> right? It's like a dog pile on the pitcher's mound every time there's a ball hit. But that's the point of baseball at that age, isn't it? You're on the roster. You have a spot. You're a player. You got the uniform. You got all the tools. You're legit, right? You're just there to learn. The same is true for you and for me. You are brand new in Jesus. You are on the roster. Your name is written in the book of life because of what Jesus has done for you. You have the uniform of being called forgiven, clothed. And see how Jesus puts that, that white cloth on you. That's why we have all the white up here this morning. It symbolizes how God has made you clean through this death and this resurrection. He's given that perfection to you. You have all the tools. God's own spirit promised to be with you. You have everything that you need, but the game right now is not about crushing it over the fence. It's about learning it until Jesus comes back. That's what this is. That's what it means to be brand new. Brand new. But don't be fooled this morning. You are brand new. Those of you who got into a fight on the drive over to church this morning, you're brand new and so is the person that you're fighting with, right? <laughs> Those of you who are wearing the exact same outfit as you did last year on Easter, we see you, we love you, and you're brand new as well. Those of you who've got a brand new outfit on, you want everyone to know, and you waltzed in here, right, smiling, all happy, you look incredible. You're brand new. Those of you who went to the doctor this week, maybe you got some bad news. You're brand new. Maybe you did something yesterday that you didn't want to do, and you don't want anyone else to know that you did. You're brand new. Those of you who have clouds of anxiety that hang over you all the time, you can't shake it, you can't outrun it, and you wonder when you'll just be done with it, you too are still brand new right now. I know a lot of it is not yet, right? But right now, you are new and you're learning what that means. That's the promise. Then I also know we have people here who are skeptical of all this. I get it. The reason that you're here is because this is what you're supposed to do, to be a good spouse, a good son, a good daughter on this high, holy day here? You have to be here. Not necessarily because you rolled out of bed being like, hey, let's put on some awkward clothes and go to church. I get it. You're skeptical. Most of the people that I talk to when it comes to Easter, they're skeptical really of two things. First, they're skeptical of the reliability of the resurrection of Jesus. And they're skeptical of the relevance of the resurrection of Jesus. And so if I can, I just want to speak briefly to that uh, for a moment. When it comes to the reliability of the resurrection of Jesus, is it really true 
that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the most historically verifiable moments in all of history. What do you think? Yes, it is. Over 500 eyewitnesses see the resurrected Christ. And so much more can be said on this. But very quickly, what I'll say is this. Among many things that can be said in support of the reliability of the resurrection of Jesus, two that I often return to are these. Number one, if this was simply a fabricated story in order to keep some kind of movement going after Jesus died and stayed dead, if this were all a lie, certainly those at the center of the lie would have told a different story. Think about it. Because if you tell this story, if you read this story, what you're going to see is that it paints the disciples in a very poor light. Yes, Jesus rises from the dead, but everybody else looks really, really bad for not believing in him, for denying him, for disowning him. And even when he's resurrected, looking at him face to face and, face to face and being like, I ain't so sure, right? I'm not sure about this whole thing. Doubting. Most people, when they make up a lie, they paint themselves in a positive tone. The only reason that they would tell a story that talks about the resurrection of Jesus but paint all the other main players in a negative light is if that's the way it really happened. And everybody knew it and there's no other story to tell. The other thing that I hold on to is this, that if Jesus Christ hadn't been raised from the dead, then how do you account for all the people who said that they saw him? Told that story for the rest of their lives and were willing to die for that story. People will die for things that they believe to be true, but rarely will people, let alone whole groups of people, die for something they know to be a lie. And yet what you have, especially among the disciples here, is a claim that they saw the resurrected Jesus and then they dedicated the rest of their lives telling that story. Even when people said, if you keep telling that story, we're going to have you killed. And they said, I can't stop because that is what happened and it changes everything and I'm willing to lay down my life for it. And they did in brutal, brutal ways, never once recanting. How do you explain that? If you want to dive more deeply into the questions of the reliability of the resurrection of Jesus, I gathered some resources for you and I have them available for you. Uh, there's a QR code on the screen. There's also a, on the website, gstx.org slash resources. You can go there. I have a bunch of stuff there that you can take a look at. But when it comes to the relevance of this story, I'll just say this. You may have questions, what difference does the resurrection of Jesus make when I'm dropping my kid off at practice or when I'm taking my mom to her doctor's appointment or if I'm having drinks with my friends? And I understand that. But let me say this. You know the old. You feel the old. You know that this old world lurks. And what we believe is that the problem underneath all problems is sin and the evils of humanity and the sting of death. The problem underneath the problems at work, the problems underneath the problems in your relationships, the problem underneath the problems in your finances, in everything, is this broken nature of humanity and this sting of death that haunts each and every one of us. And yet one of the two things that Jesus has confronted, he confronted the evils of this world and he defeated death in this world. So don't tell me it doesn't have any relevance to your life. Of course it does. It's the most relevant thing in this world. Starting next Sunday, that's exactly what we're going to be diving into in our next series. I just want to invite you back. Um, if you live far away, make the drive. It'll be fun. Join us online. <laughs> just kidding. That series is going to talk about how the resurrection of Jesus redefines our life. How God gives us these words like grace and peace and lordship. And how those things can never be taken away from you. And even more so, it's going to give us peace in our heart. Look, what I know is this. You and I, we both feel the old. We feel the broken and the bad hanging over us and burdening us. And that's why we hunger for the new. But what we believe as followers of Jesus is that the new has come. Jesus Christ has ushered in a world where death is defeated and sin is forgiven. And the question is, if you're gonna go looking for something new somewhere, are you looking in the right place? Because if you go and try to find the new thing in this old world, I promise you it's not going to satisfy, at least not for a long time. Eventually the old, the broken, the bad, the dying, the decaying, the destructive will break through and what you're hoping for will not be in your hands anymore. But here comes Jesus, he's risen from the grave and he's defeated the old and he hands to you the new. And what he gives to you is something that you can clear your conscience 
that can secure your future, that can fill you with peace day by day all the way into eternity with him. I love what the prophet Isaiah says in chapter 43. It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. Here's the sweetest part. And remembers your sins no more. I'll close with this. Last night, I was putting some finishes, finishing touches on some of the plans for today, and I was playing around with the AI um, image creator, looking for an abstract image of the empty tomb, something that represents the resurrection of Jesus. And this is what I came up with. Looks pretty good, right? Now, as you look at that abstract interpretation of the empty tomb, consider this. In the moments immediately following Jesus' resurrection from the grave, three words began to be said. Three words that were said by those who saw the empty tomb, who saw him alive in the flesh and blood. And then those three words were repeated for weeks and months and now millennia. And they went from being words that simply described the moment of Jesus's resurrection to describing a new reality that all who follow after him and believe have entered into this new reality, into this new world where they are a new thing, a new creation that truly satisfies the answer that we have in our human hearts that the new thing has finally emerged, that Christ has made a way back for us forever. And those three words were this, and I just want you to say these three words with me, okay? Just these three. He is risen, right? If you want some way to express your faith, your belief, your trust in this new world that, that we have in Christ, that this need has arrived in Jesus. If you wanted to declare to yourself, to the people around you, and to this world that we're surrounded by the old, but we believe that the new has come, the new that is needed, would you humor me again in just saying these three words? He is risen. One more time. He is risen. Though we live in a world that is confused and frightened, please say it. He is risen. You make mistakes that persist and regrets are piled high. Say it again. He is risen. Though we have leaders who disappoint us in politics and cultural issues that divide us, say it. He is risen. Though you feel misunderstood, isolated, and alone, say it again. He is risen. My friends, there is mercy for every moment. There is forgiveness for every failure. There is life in the face of death. The old is gone. The new is here. All because he is risen, he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let's pray.